Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. This is a COVID-19 series. I'm here with the godfather, John O'Sullivan. How are you, sir? Yeah, funnily enough, I'm at home. Um, and interestingly, the last two weeks have, have been the busiest I can ever remember. Um, we've, we've carried on holding elite meetings all the time. And all of my clients that I'm NED for or advisor to, we've kind of upped the level of contact to almost daily. Yeah. Um, so it's an extraordinary feeling whilst there's, you know, the markets are suppressed, uh, the level of activity for, from an advisor's perspective is, is very, very much more than normal. So busy is no, now. It, it was getting business as usual in that boom market. It was just success story after success story. And now all of a sudden, everybody's staff members are, are really experiencing their first recession or their first bit. And it's been such good times for millennial recruiters that all of a sudden you have to guide them through a difficult market. You have to do it remotely. And there's uncertainty as to spend, as to who's keeping their jobs. What can you describe how, how you've seen the last couple of weeks from the, the overall market response? Yeah, so I suppose um, the, the first level of response as, as the, the threat started to build up was that people started to panic, I think, uh, because it became clear that you know, this was going to be more serious than people originally thought. And I guess as, as recruiters, we are in a service industry that regardless of what we think about the crisis, it's how our clients and candidates react that's going to guide largely what we do. Um, so I think there was a little bit of panic and running for the hills in the first week. Um, I think when the, the government uh, furloughing uh, thing came along, I think that was very welcomed. Some had already got a little bit trigger happy and they'd let people go uh, un unwisely, I think, um, but have subsequently furloughed those people. Um, but in amongst it all, having you know cut costs and got the costs to fit the potential income, having made certain assumptions, working assumptions about what that might be, um, there's definitely more of a sense of positivity around with the workers that are remaining in companies. They're trying to do different things for clients. And as I'm sure you've probably heard, there are some sectors and some clients within sectors who are still recruiting. Um, and are still I just sold a retainer before coming on this. Well, there you go. And, <laughs> and I, I, I didn't think it was possible, but it, you know, I, I've just been saying to be like, I've just been checking in with people. How are you going? And some of them have said, look, we're still hiring. Um, we're taking this as an opportunity to scoop up the best people. Um, Absolutely. The world's going to go on in three months' time, and yep. we've been careful with our cash. I, th I think that's really mature thinking. And uh, you, know, you mentioned recessions earlier, and th this has got some similarities with, with recessions that I've been through and some things that are very different. I mean, this... There's an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented, I find, at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's, this is very unusual. I don't think anybody in business has experienced sort of a global shutdown to the extent yeah. that one has been. Um, but there are commonalities, you know, uh, certainly in 2008, the, the, the downturn happened pretty quickly and it was ferocious. Um, and some of the ways that one needs to act around staff retention, um, around how, how do you make sure you don't, you, you know, you, you keep the keep the patient alive, ready for the upturn, are, are similar. Uh, the difference here, I guess the, the core companies are going to make here is, you know, how long is this going to last? Is it going to be business as usual? Is it going to be a slow build up back? Is it going to be a changing uh, landscape out there? Um, and what sort of skeletal team do they need to keep in place to do what needs to be done to monetize what's available to monetize? And I think that's been the, the thrust of this second week, having cut, it's more about rethinking, you know, rebuilding, getting one's uh, self into shape uh, for what might be ahead. How, but I'm hearing crazy numbers. Like, um, I'm hearing firms, I'm not going to name any, but I'm hearing firms cutting 30 to 50 to 70 to 80 in different regional marketplaces, large yep. brands. How do, you, how do you onboard all those people back into your business? How... Like, because we're based, like, you'll know this more than me, but we base our hiring projections based on our cash flow and based on what we think we get in the door and the runway that we have and the momentum that's built up in the office. How can you go from taking everybody out and then trying to get back to that place where we were at, 
surely a lot of those people who are on furlough, they're, they're not going to go back to those companies. No, and I think, you know, the thinking has been more along the, those lines this week. Once the emergency uh, work has been done, it's more about, you know, how do we get back into shape? And the stories you talk about, I mean, t two companies that I work with are each, each uh, extreme of, of the scale. One has taken their headcount from 60 down to 10 um, because they've got to. And, and uh, the other has taken uh, out of 250 staff, only furloughed 30. Um, because they've got projects and assignments and RPO work that they're working on and therefore have, have uh, legacy revenues coming in, contracted revenues coming in. And all points in between. Uh, so I've seen the whole, the whole yeah. range of it this, these last couple of weeks. But you're, you're absolutely right. One of the things that is common uh, to the other recessions, uh, it's reputed that in 2008-9, about 80,000 people left the recruitment industry. And of course, pretty well, I would say the majority of those never came back. Yeah. Uh, the furlough does op offer us an opportunity to suspend them and hold them in sort of suspense with a view to bringing them back. But that's going to be very, very carefully handled. And I've seen some clever stuff done this week around the way that the comms have been handled around it, the, the way that people have, been, have accepted it, um, the way that contact is being maintained whilst they're on furlough. Um, and our, my general view is it's a more sophisticated uh, picture uh, mm. than back in, in, in the in 08, 09, in terms I, of keeping, trying to keep people on board. I, I, I'm seeing under the hood from the people yeah. who are furloughed. Yeah. So, some of it's very good, some of yeah. it's pretty yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and just as well for us, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's opportunity for them, there's opportunity for us. They, people are always after the best people. Some people have been caught in in sectors some firms have been doing really well but only off a couple of key clients and yeah. they've really been caught with their pants down when when this has got this has happened it's a uh, it's it, it's just like a perfect storm but it is I, it feels to me that like america is putting in massive stimulus projects so um they're they're going to pump loads of money into the infrastructure they're also making funds available to to uh to businesses and that should go live very soon um hopefully and that should kick off everything and the hope is for me trump gets us back in business by june i don't know yeah. walk me through walk me through what what a typical meeting's been like with the the, the NED clients that you're on NED with, uh, what like outside of like cash flow and cutting, what other type of things are you talking about? Well, really, what you just what you just touched upon. What's the future? One that I was on this morning uh, on a, on a Zoom uh, board meeting was literally that. Look, we we've done what we've had to do. Uh, that in this particular instance, they're much smaller company, about thirty people, and have let ten go with a phase two of perhaps another five. I think they've handled the comms really well. And in, in, a, in another moment of time, I'll show you some communication back from the staff to the owners. Mm. Um, that, you know, I think the culture and environment there has led to those people feeling they haven't just been dumped. Um, so, and, and that they're being well treated while, whilst on furlough, however long that may be. But the, the conversation today and a few others have been, what will that landscape look like? It, when, when will it come back? Will it come back quickly? Uh, will it be a slow build back up? And of course, you've got all these alleged experts on social media saying they know what it's going to look like because they don't really. They're trying to monitor. <laughs> but, uh, is, that a, is, that a, is that a pointed comment there, is it? <laughs> no, not, not really. I suppose it's just, and, and it's not really just about recruitment industry. There's a, there are a lot of um, companies that I think will be remembered for how they acted yeah. when this happened, yeah. uh, whether as a potential employer or whether as a potential supplier. Um, you know, and I think all of us will think twice about how we deal with the likes of Sports Direct and, and you know, airlines that, you know, have, have, have let us down. Um, but um, you know, at the same time, they've got to face reality, haven't they? And, that, yeah. you know, finances do rule the roost to some extent. And some companies, of course, have deep pockets and they've built sort of cash surpluses that allow themselves to say, no, we're just going to sit this out. Uh, we're going to keep, keep our show on the road. Um, there aren't many of those. Um, not but not sizable, eh? No, well, not at the end of the day, nobody's got money to waste, have they? Yeah. Um, but if you do believe it's relatively short term 
and you do believe uh, that it's as a strategy it's the right one to keep 11 players on the pitch ready to come back and you can afford it then that probably is the right thing to do yeah. the conversation are definitely turning more to what what does that future world look like? And mm. and I think the context of that, I think the whole world of recruitment is changing anyway. I'm sure you do too. Um, but I think what this has done is escalated the thinking around it yeah. in terms of client behaviour, in terms of you know, how we attract candidates, how we operate, what client relationships are like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting that, that piece. Um, there's loads I could jump into on that, but we were a lot of us were heading towards a 180 model where you know you keep your salespeople in one area and then you have your your account manager slash you know sourcing team separate when this happened the first thing you do is cut your sourcing team um because everybody just needs people who can generate revenue in the short term to be able to feed them uh, so that i think a lot of companies were halfway through that strategy and, th and thinking like that and then this happened so that's kind of put everything up in the air but it's definitely for focused companies to look at the remote working world and distributed yep. teams. Do you think? Do you think maybe firms will be looking, thinking twice about those big offices in Manhattan and London in the future? Is that? Yeah, I think I think it, it, there's a danger that we over egg that and think, well, working from home wasn't so bad. Let, let's just do let's just do that from now on. We don't need offices. Um, I think what it has done is those that were toying with more flexibility with their workforce, you know, they, they're beginning to realise in some cases that actually it can work quite well. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit early in the day for some to judge whether a working from home culture works for certain individuals. You know, there's still a novelty about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So to, to completely do a handbrake turn and take that model on board is probably premature. But I could certainly see a future where you know a recruitment company has a hub um, office in in the in the major conurbation, so London and New York, for example, no. um, and that and I think it was already happening where sourcing teams and other people have a much more flexible working arrangement. So I think the notion of we've got a hundred people, let's have a hundred desks, um, which was already under review, I think is is going to really really escalate one of the companies i'm chair of half of their staff are um they work in the rpo msp mm. teams um, and therefore for them good business is an empty office because yeah. it brings everybody out. Um, and it's quite bizarre we've still got an office that would house them all if they turned up uh, but we I, won't we probably won't have i probably i probably sit in the same campus yeah i i had joe mullings on and he was saying he believed he's on the other side he he likes to have people in office so he likes the center of the flame to be there and people to feed off each other and i think there's a place for that but i also think there's a place for the, the distributed teams as well so you, it, yeah. it probably has fast forwarded us a little bit on that on that path yeah. the other bit i was thinking is it's probably like our biggest issue is that we're not keeping recruiters in the industry long enough so then we're we're just we're just training grads to annoy people instead of keeping experts over a long period of time. Maybe more flexibility for those who are more tenured might help the reputation of the industry as a whole. Yeah, I, I would think that's true. And again, as you said, th this situation is just is, is just fast tracking what you've sensibly just said. You know, to continue to churn. The, the, the way we've done business before, taking on the grads. I like the way you say it, just to irritate everybody. Um, and to <laughs> irritate them in some ways. Well, look, I mean, it, it, I, it works, but at the same time, they're gone in 18, 18 months, two years. And yeah. it, you might get more productivity out of them in that time, but over, over a long period of time, if you can keep people, it's always better. But I always, I always point to the states, funnily enough. And if you, if you look at things, not just in recruitment, but also if you look at realtors in the states, you know, they tend to be older people, sometimes in their 50s and 60s. And you think about that. If you were going to buy a house, you're a young person buying a house, it's really cool to talk to somebody with all that life experience. Okay. Um, and it's, it's only in the UK that we've got this sort of culture of youth. Um, yeah. And we've created it ourselves. You know, if you're still a resourcer by... 17 you know you failed um whereas in fact, I, you know i think being a good resource it takes a huge amount of sophistication and maturity and i think we should 
and hopefully will see um, professional recruiters into their 40s and even 50s. Something now that we'd frown upon, but, but yeah. I think as an industry we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. Uh, like we've got a, we've had a guest on here a couple of times called Rich Rosen. He builds a million and a half from his home in Boston, and he's in his fifties. Yeah. Yeah. It's just him. He has some some admin sourcing support. They like to do some some deals with. I, I know that's a lifestyle business owner, so it's not it's not like a scalable model. But we, one of our clients, uh, the Mullings Group, lots of people in their forties, um, yeah. and it. It, it definitely works in the boutique world. The UK model, without trying to piss people off, it is a large part is drive it like you stole it for a little bit with these younger people. So it's, it's how to transition that bit through but still keep results high is the... Is yeah, I think I, I'm not holding out a banner for old people because I'm old, by the way. I genuinely believe this and I've always believed it. Um, you know, I can, I can remember as, just as, as a line manager back in the day, I had some resources, much, much older, and working from home, flexible model. They were just absolutely shit hot. Uh, and you couldn't have hired anybody like that under you when you were out of school. They'd have been the needle in the haystack. Mm. Uh, so I do, again, it's another example of uh, how this industry might change into the future. Because if you think about it, let's, let's imagine for a moment that this is a three or four or five, six month thing, and we're back. Uh, with with high levels of demand, uh, which I think we probably will be, bearing in mind the underlying skill shortages haven't gone away, they've been suspended. Mm -hmm. Um, Then if you couple that with the fact, we said earlier in this call, a lot of people will have left the industry for good um, and will have had a chance to reflect on their lives and not come back to it. Uh, We could yet again, and I've experienced this before, be a massively understaffed industry in a market that's characterized by massive demand, and in that circumstance, you've got to think outside the box. So let's, um, let's talk about thinking outside the box. In terms of those people who need to pivot right now and what, what they should be doing, what verticals would you be looking at over, like, let's imagine we're on a five or a 10 year run after this. When, when you say verticals, you mean in what sort of sector should be recruiting? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I only work in sectors where um, the, their white collar professional sectors, whether that's technology, pharma, pharma, pharmaceutical, uh, financial, etc. And, and I think that those uh, um, that should always be under review. Th- this crisis shouldn't necessarily change that. There might be some short term opportunities to to veer uh, uh, towards one more than another. Um, but I think that should always be under review. And therefore, you know, the areas where you are expert. Uh, where you have got a presence and a brand and a, and a positioning, uh, where you have access to, to talent pools and you've got meaningful client relationships, they should govern those sorts of decisions anyway. Um, I don't think this crisis is going to kill off any previously abundant sectors necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ones that were drifting away were drifting away anyway, um, but over a longer period of time. Um, but certainly the majority of my clients are you know, digital technology, uh, white collar professional sector, mm. so but very broadly, that's where I'd stay. Yeah, no, no it, it's all good. What uh, what should uh, business owners be doing in this time with their staff? With their staff perhaps to work, and what type of messages should they be giving them? Well, that's a that's a really good question, and I think this is this is the big test for a lot of the young guys who haven't been through this before. And this is why I think they have got to be careful where they're picking up their advice on social media because you know, they've got to cut through the bullshit stuff that's you know, coming, coming downstream at them. And I suppose, it, without meaning to be glib, the first thing they've got to do is, is, is be, be leaders, be decisive, uh, be confident, um, be scared <laughs> if a little bit uh, because that's appropriate as well. But I think you, you've got to really show strong leadership traits. You've got to make the right decisions. You've got to communicate incredibly effectively, um, really with, with the community of your staff, but also uh, with your clients as well. This, this is a real opportunity for leaders to shine and to show that they're actually in control of their own situation to the extent that they can be. Um, they're reacting in, in, in the right and appropriate way um, and, and keeping in, in control to the extent that they can can and that's certainly advice I've been given to to, to my my uh, charges and, you know it's really satisfying the board meeting I was on this morning all the stuff we agreed last week 
Um, so it was a really difficult conversation at the first board. They've done it now. They've actually followed that guidance. And a week on, they look in control. They sound in control. They feel under control. Their staff are cool. The client communications are going out and consistent. And, and they're getting retainers, funnily enough, <laughs> like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. So that sense of shit panic has, in the right leaders <clears throat> and the right companies led properly, has started to calm down a little bit bit now um, but it, it you know I suppose a one line on that is now, now is the time what kind of leader are you um, would, would do people follow you are, are you just trying to make a fast buck are you just trying to be clever and sound bite it or, or are you actually do you actually have some substance about you and that is as true in this crisis as it was in all the other recessions that I've been through um, when are we getting out of this well I'd get now I would say um, there's another lockdown coming, as I'm sure we know. I don't know if it's even been announced yet. We missed the five o'clock briefing, but I think there'll be a, another lockdown of three or four weeks, probably three. Um, a lot will depend upon uh, behaviour and data. I think I'm hoping that some of the media hype stops and we start to get really some real... Really holding that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much bullshit out there from Piers Morgan to Gary Lineker to, you know, they're all, all, all the ones who are normally bullshitting are out there bullshitting. Uh, so what we need is real data, real information um, that will govern how we react. I've, my crystal ball isn't better than anybody else's, but I, I, would, I think we'll start to return to more normalised working conditions um, as early as end of May, early June. Here's hoping. Uh, John, how can people find you and uh, how can they join Elite Leaders? Well, just get on the website. Uh, it's eliteleaders.co.uk. Um, have a look at that. But anybody's uh, very welcome to get in touch with me. That's john at eliteleaders.co.uk. Um, I did put something out on LinkedIn last week that said, look, you know, normal rules of engagement are off here. If you're in the shit and you just want a little bit of help from somebody older, give me a call. And I got a really good response from that. And, uh, and I wasn't looking at it from a commercial point of view. I was looking at it from a giving something back to the industry point of view. And it's been really satisfying to, you know, send out papers, have conversations with, invite people who aren't elite members along to the weekly elite sessions that we're having. Uh, we had you know, 65 people yesterday morning on a call. Um, and, you know, get, get in touch with us. We'll help you now. Um, clearly in the longer term, if you're serious about building your business and we can all afford it again, jump on board and we'd love to talk to you about the potential of joining elite leaders but you know in the short term if you just want any help drop us a line drop me an email give, make a call um that that's kind of the stance i've taken on this for the time being um so yeah that's uh, i suppose we're fit for purpose more than ever and it's not surprising really that uh, you know we're, we're we're as busy as we are because i think people have finally realized you know what the six or seven principles within elite and we're probably the least panicked group that I know because we kind of know what's going to happen. And here's what's going to happen. It's going to be all right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, don't know exactly when, but it's going to be, right. be all right. We're going to get through it. Well, I've got a couple of questions for you. I'm going to ask you after this, but thanks so much for coming on. Always appreciate your time, your wisdom, your reflection. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get you on again when we're clear of this so you can tell everybody I told you so. Brilliant. Thanks for your time. Thanks, John.